name is Thomas Quinlan. I'm the director of the solution architecture for Northern Europe at Zscaler. Uh, we are a vendor, so keep that in mind right off the bat. Um, this is a presentation that I worked with with a colleague, worked on with a colleague of mine called Tony Ferguson, who is a CISO uh, in our organization for EMEA. And I will warn you now that I tend to pace when I talk, and the microphone is in a fixed position, so I may wander away from it, but I will try not to. So today we're going to be talking about zero trust made simple. So first and foremost, of the audience, who here has not heard the term zero trust? Yeah, that's okay. One person, that's about an infinite percent higher than I usually get. So it is something of a buzzword these days, of course. So we uh, generally want to talk about it, but we want to talk about what it actually is as opposed to what vendors tend to say it is. Uh, so that's what we're going to do today. So I'll go ahead and get started. How do we get to buzzword central? So ultimately, zero trust is actually a term that's been around for a while. It's been around for about 10 years or so. Uh, the original paper by John Kindervag came out um, probably in the early 2000s. Prior to that, it was technically uh, thought of by a different name by the United States Department of Defense, probably as early as the 70s or 80s. And then Google sort of picked up on it as well with their Beyond Corp idea, which they never actually did anything with until very recently. So it's not something that is ultimately something that came up in the last two years, although it certainly seems that way from its current popularity. So we use a lot of food analogies when we talk about computer security, network security, cloud security. I'm not quite sure why, but the idea is that you can represent what a network looks like with some kind of food. So generally, we talk about M&Ms or we talk about coconuts where we're talking about a hard exterior and a soft interior, which is how most of the security that we've done up until the last couple of years has been uh, taking place. But ultimately, um, as we talk about food, we also think about what it means that we're going to be talking about for today. The zero trust concept was further solidified by what's known as the Jericho Forum. And that is from quite some time ago as well. And ultimately, they put out a list of commandments. And those commandments, number five specifically, say that any device should be able to maintain its status on an untrusted network. So it has to remain secure even if the actual network that it's on is not secure. And so if we get back to the food analogy, things start to get a little bit weird because how do you represent something that is both disparate and together? How do we think about stuff like that? I think of it as a watermelon, which will take some explaining, which is what I'm going to attempt to do now. But ultimately, at least in my experience, watermelons, they have the hard outside, the soft inside. But what makes them particularly tricky is that in any given bite, you don't exactly know what you're going to get. So they have the seeds, of course. They have the large black seeds, which are easy enough to pick out. But they also have those tiny little white seeds. So whenever you're actually trying to eat a watermelon, you have to kind of be careful about what it is that you're going to get in your next bite. And I thought about that because ultimately, when you are thinking about zero trust, when you're trying to think about what it is that an organization is trying to do with their computer security, suddenly we have these disparate things we have to think about. Previously, everything was in the data center. We could keep track of it. We could use our hard exterior for our soft interior. But nowadays, it's a little trickier. We have things like mobile phones. We have things like bring your own device. We have all of these concepts that keep popping up every time we try to think about what it is that we're doing with respect to security. But ultimately, as it says on the slide, zero trust is a framework for securing organizations. Ultimately, we talk about that fifth rule again, that the particular device, the particular identity needs to be secure regardless of the actual network that that user or device is on. So what is it at the most basic level? So if we think about the security that we've been providing to organizations for pretty much our entire careers, mine goes back 25 years, ultimately we have been doing several things to provide security. So the first in the standard or current model is going to be the three A's. 
authentication, authentication, authorization, and then auditing or accounting. So we have to make sure that people are who they say they are, that they are allowed to use the system or service in question, and that we keep track of what it is that they're doing through some methodology while they're actually using it for multiple reasons, but ultimately for security. In this model, we then provide access next. This can be most often illustrated by the use of a VPN, but ultimately you go into a network, you're given an IP address. That IP address is going to come with access to at least a subnet or VLAN of some kind. From there, what we typically do is we typically use policy to then pull back the access in some fashion that we have already granted to a user. If we think about what this means for a VPN user, for example, everybody started working from home all of a sudden two and a half years ago, and that turned out to be lots of fun for everybody, but specifically for folks in the security industry or who were running VPNs. Aside from the fact that you suddenly had to implement licensing that you didn't anticipate, you also had policies that were essentially now extending your network through the VPN to every single user and every single threat that that user had or potentially had on their device for the next two years. And so ultimately, organizations were forced to take their network and extend it out potentially hundreds of thousands of times for really big organizations with a lot of employees. That is not the best way to do security. So if we think about what this should look like or what it's starting to look like with the zero trust model, we start with the three A's again. We start with who is this person? What is this device? We have to make sure that we have a good identity picture. We're going to talk about identity quite a bit today because that is what zero trust is based on. Rather than the concept of giving a user an IP address, we need to know who that user is and what that user needs access to. So it's not going to be a question of do I have the right IP address, but do I have the right policy? So you have, say, connectivity between a user and a particular resource. So if salespeople need access to Salesforce. Help desk folks need access to ServiceNow, things like that. If they're all stored or the applications you're connecting people to are stored in the same place, people can poke around. People can try and figure out where things live, or they may know where things live just by learning about it from their colleagues. But ultimately, what we want to move towards is the concept of making sure that applications and resources are accessible by identity and not by network presence. And so in the zero trust model, once we've determined the person's identity and we have examined policy, only then do we provide access. And that's a very important distinction, because if you do not have policy-based access to a particular resource, you should not be granted any kind of access to it at all. And that's ultimately what Zero Trust allows us to do. We take a user, their identity, map them in some fashion to the things that they need, and only the things that they need, and provide access to it rather than providing access to a network. So when we start to talk about how this actually works, this example is going to be quite illustrative, but can anybody spot the differences between the two vehicles on the screen? The grill, okay. That's the first one. The wheel, there's a red caliper on the left-hand side, but not on the right. But fundamentally, as far as I know, those are the only two differences on the exterior of the car. They're both BMWs, they're both blue, and other than the grille and the caliper color, externally, they look exactly the same. But when we look under the hood, when we start to think about what it is that's actually happening with these cars, we can see a distinct difference now that the shell has been removed. Ultimately, on the left-hand side, we're looking at a car with an internal combustion engine. On the right-hand side, we're looking at essentially an electric car. And it doesn't seem like that big a difference. If we think about internal combustion engines, those have been around since the 1800s. And technically, this form of uh, electric car has been around only for a decade or so. We actually started with electric cars historically, but I won't get into that. Um, but when we look 
at the left hand side, we see a vehicle that has 2000 moving parts in the engine. And when we started with internal combustion engines back in the day, they were about 4% efficient. So how efficient do you think they are after 150 years of optimization? Anybody want to guess? <laughs> Actually, it's a little better than that. It's 40%. So 150 years of automotive engineering has led to only a 10% or sorry, a 10x increase in efficiency, which for 150 years isn't all that great. If we look at the vehicle on the right, however, we have 20 moving parts as opposed to 2000. So only 1% of the actual friction that we have to worry about in that sense. And this is 85% efficient. And we got there after 10 years. The reason that I illustrate this is not because um, I'm a car aficionado or anything like that, but ultimately it speaks to a new way of doing things. We have similar technology. It's a car on one side and car on the other, but it's how we build it. It's how we use it. It's rethinking the paradigm that we all use to be able to do the sorts of things that we want to do. And ultimately, when we talk about zero trust, architecture really matters. And that becomes very well illustrated when we start to look at the diagram on the left, which is a typical corporate network diagram. This is actually, if I'm not mistaken, something that one of our customers presented to us. It has been, of course, anonymized, but the sort of complexity that you have on the left-hand side speaks to the sort of things that we've all encountered over time when we talk about computer security, because we have had to cobble together a lot of point products, a lot of different services, and a lot of things to then manage all of those things to be able to get even the remotest idea of what it is that we're actually doing when it comes to computer security. We employ lots of people, we employ a lot of services, we employ a lot of machines to be able to build this model, and it has served us quite well for a really long time. But just as we have electric cars now, we are starting to move to a more software-defined everything. And that allows us to start embracing new ways to be able to do security, to be able to do networking, identity, and user compute. All of these pieces come together, and when they're software defined, we can do appreciably more with respect to actually providing zero trust in the sense that it's meant to be talked about. Sticking with the theme, the most common error of a smart engineer is to optimize a thing that shouldn't exist. So love him or hate him, he is a smart individual and his paradigm within the organizations that he has created is that we want to eliminate as much as possible. And we do the same thing with zero trust. We want to eliminate as much as possible so that we can get away from that ugly diagram that we saw on the left hand side and move towards the sort of things that we should be looking at. So what are the components of zero trust? What should we be looking at when we determine the types of things that we need to optimize, that we need to keep because we need them to be able to provide the services that we provide as the organizations we are? So the first is identity. This becomes essentially the new perimeter. I'm sure you've heard the phrase, the identity is the new perimeter. It's an accurate phrase, even if it is a nice marketing term. The reason for that is because, again, we're providing policy-based access to resources based on who you are and what you need, not necessarily what network you should connect to. And in fact, the network becomes plumbing. From there, we look at the device. Well, I have two devices in my various pockets. I'm sure you guys have several devices. I have an iPad and a laptop out in the hallway, so I'm carrying four. Should they be able to access the Zscaler corporate network if there were one? Who knows? But I can use my identity, and I can use the device's identity to determine that via policy. Infrastructure. We talk about infrastructure, and I just finished telling you that the network is going to become plumbing. But ultimately, you do still need connectivity. But how you connect to things may change. And in fact, it's going to change pretty drastically as soon as 5G becomes mainstream. Because I can pretty much go anywhere on Earth, although there are a couple of places where you can't, and get connectivity, which means that I could be in the desert of Jordan and I could actually connect to my work back in California without any issue, especially once um, 
they finish filling the skies with satellites. But ultimately, the infrastructure is still something we have to think about, but it doesn't necessarily become something we have to secure because we can do that with identity and policy. We have to look at data. The idea behind the data piece is, of course, that we need to be able to provide data to people. That's what they're trying to access through their identity and their device. We have to secure it at rest, and we have to secure it in motion. But that becomes much easier when you can start to think about things like outside-in connections as part of an architecture. So you can start to hide those things which you were previously publicly broadcasting on the internet behind a zero trust solution so that your data center, your public cloud, essentially goes dark. People can't scan what they can't see. When we talk about data in motion, that makes it pretty straightforward security-wise. You just SSL encrypt it, as we all do. Data at rest, we can use APIs to do things like CASB. Workloads, same thing. We talk about users communicating with many things, but we have to think about things communicating with each other as well in much the same way. And then finally, visibility, automation, and governance. This is probably a topic which could take 30 minutes by itself, if not longer. But ultimately, the ability to see from end to end becomes a different proposition when you are, in fact, remote. If you are in California and you're trying to connect to something that's located in London, do you have visibility of the entire path for a user and are you backhauling them all the way to London just to bring them back to California when they could be connecting locally through something like a secure service edge to a server in Los Angeles or San Francisco? So zero trust, as a buzzword I mentioned at the start, is just that. But there are actually technical definitions of what it is. And you can reference those for yourself. So the NIST 800-207 from the United States government published what it is that they consider zero trust to be. So you don't have to take the vendor's word for it. You can go look at what it means. What does it mean to do zero trust and how can we do it simply? And how can we do it over time? And ultimately what it comes down to is the sort of thing that we see here. So this is actually taken from that publication. And you'll notice that they start to split things into planes. So at the bottom, we have the data plane. And at the top, we have the control plane. And this is going to make a little bit more sense in just a second. But when we think about it, we have a user. They call it a subject in this case. They're using a system, neither of which should be trusted by default. And they are trying to access a resource. So what do we do? We use context to develop policy. That policy is in the control plane and is a policy engine. We use that to control risk. Should this user have access to Facebook? Should this user have access to my particular applications within the data center? If they have access, what kind of access should they have? Should they be able to read? Should they be able to write? Should they be able to attach things? All these things can be controlled via policy. And then finally, we need an enforcement plane of some kind. We need to be able to actually enforce the policy. We used to do this, and in fact, we still do. The problem is, as you can see on the left-hand side, through the traditional security stack, we do each of those things multiple times. Every single box in this stack adds another hop for the user and makes their experience worse. It provides all of the things that we need, control, enforcement, and logging, but you're doing it at every step, and you need to be able to have something that then aggregates all of the data out of these systems into essentially another logging platform to then make sense of it all. And in that perspective, it becomes exceedingly difficult to continue to scale these sorts of things. Many vendors will, of course, say they scale. We're no different. But it's how seamlessly can it be done that is the ultimate question when it comes to something like this. We, of course, uh, lucked out, I think, in some fashion. Our CEO created a cloud proxy. And by picking a proxy, we kind of lucked ourselves into the perfect architecture for 15 years later, which is today, in that we are doing this in a horizontally scalable fashion that then allows you to do it where it needs to be done and not at every specific point. And then, of course, the seamless scalability just involves horizontally scaling each particular level of the tree on the right-hand side. So. If we stop to think about zero trust, 
generally, people think about it, buzzword, sure. But then what does it actually mean from an operationalization perspective? What do we actually have to do? Well, first of all, nobody does it overnight, just in case you're wondering. I can assure you of that. My team, we help organizations actually plan how they're going to do that, and we have never provided a plan that was less than a year. Most of the time, they're three. Sometimes they're five. And so in that sense, it is a journey. It is something that you actually have to think about how you're going to do it. The first step is generally users. You can secure the users, you can empower them, you can provide better visibility for them, of them, and you can provide a way that they can get things done faster and better pretty easily. Then you think about the data, as I mentioned earlier, where is it, what do I need to protect? How do I provide the policy between those two? We all work with third parties, contractors, suppliers, who knows? We can enable those folks too, as well. Ultimately, we want to provide them access to things that we consider the crown jewels, but they don't even work for us half the time, or most of the time. How do I control a third party whose device does not have the specific piece of software that I can force my employees to use? How do I secure that use case? What do I do when those people start poking around? Can I provide them honeypots within the cloud to be able to do some scenarios where they ultimately start poking around and I know, hey, you're not supposed to be poking around in that. And then finally, IoT and OT. No conversation in these days is ever complete without those. But ultimately, as we start to connect all of our physical devices to the internet, we have lots of fun considerations there. And I don't want to sit here and say in any fashion that this is going to be an exciting, fun journey that you're all going to go home and sleep well at night because it's really simple and there's nothing to do after you leave work at 5 o'clock. That is not the case. There will be roadblocks. So the first one where users are concerned is that it is a different way of working. In many cases, it becomes an easier way of working, and that is ultimately what we are trying to do for people. But there may be a time, for example, when they have a VPN client and a traffic forwarder on their computer, and they have to figure out, well, what do I need to do? So we need to communicate with the users as you'd expect. Thinking about data protection, users, third parties, we also have to think about changing the architecture. How do I do this? Does my application live in SaaS? Does my application live in the public cloud? What if it's some combination? What if I have a multi-cloud environment? How do I connect Azure to AWS? If I want to do backups from my SQL Server across clouds, how do I do that? How do I secure that? How do I develop applications in the context where I suddenly have the ability to do agile DevSecOps type things when I don't even have a computer in the equation because I'm using serverless. So there's lots of different things that go into the calculus around how we not only provide architecture for the users, but for our development, for the products and services that we provide as the organization to our customers. And then, of course, getting to the point where you can actually decommission the systems that you no longer need. There is an apocryphal story of construction workers in the 90s who knocked down a wall and found a Novell network server that had been running for six years, literally behind a wall, that no one knew when it was there, but they were all using it. And it's because it was functional and it worked and they had paid for it. And so nobody thought to investigate whether or not it was still necessary. And it's the same sort of thing. I have a VPN. I have 30,000 licenses for that VPN. I've been using VPN for 10 years. Do I suddenly decommission that VPN? And if so, how do I do it? And how long does that take? Those sorts of things have to play into all of the ways that we look at implementing zero trust and ideally making it as simple as possible. So ultimately, when we start to think about what this looks like, again, from the perspective of people who may not be um, thinking about the sort of things that we're thinking about with respect to optimization, we're trying to provide business value. And that's ultimately what zero trust is going to enable us to do. The example that I typically use is if you start a company today, you will never have a data center. You will never need a data center. You will print to the cloud, you'll store everything in the cloud, your emails in the cloud. You won't have the sorts of legacy things that people today have by virtue of the fact that we've been around for a while. And so we have to start to think about how we compete with that, but how we deliver business value, how we mitigate and control risk, again, via policy as opposed to access, 
how we reduce cost and complexity. Can I remove my MPLS, my VPN, et cetera? And then, of course, increasing business agility. Once people find that they no longer have to think about where particular resources are, and security no longer has to worry about the idea of people accessing things they shouldn't, for the most part, it becomes appreciably easier to do business over time. And ultimately, that's what we want Zero Trust to do. So thank you very much.